Hey everybody, it's Eric from MSP Mountain and I wanted to talk about mistakes that MSPs make while staffing. And this is, you know, like attracting, identifying, securing, implementing, and retaining appropriate talent, you know, like everything from posting the job ads, selecting the best candidates, um, to doing the interviews, and then bring people, bringing people on board and training them up. I mean, lots of mistakes are made and... Uh, I see a lot of it because I own this staffing company called Support Adventure, um, and we provide um, staff to MSPs around the world. So the best MSPs around the world are our clients, and we find the best technicians around the world. Anyways, enough about that. What I've learned from that is how many mistakes MSPs make, like right from the start of trying to hire new people and um, right until the finish of having them on board. So let's start with job postings. There's too many must-haves on these job um, job boards like um when i see msp job descriptions it's like you have to you know you're looking for somebody who has all of the specific technologies that your msp is using and they're experts in all of that already there's no room for learning that's what the job ads look like it's just like we need someone who's done it been there and they're going to keep on doing it and we hope they'll be here for years doing the exact same thing you know this really ignores the fact that a lot of people their skills in the industry are transferable. Like from, you know, if you've set up one sort of virtualization, um, virtual host and all that sort of stuff, you know, the other ones aren't that hard to learn. Um, if you've used one version of Windows Active Directory, you know, you've got a pretty good basis of, of knowledge for like conquering the new stuff. And, you know, if, if you've used one type of uh, firewall, one type of network, you know, a lot of the stuff is very similar. So, Writing that you need someone with Cisco experience and Azure AD experience and VMware host experience specifically and others need not apply is probably not going to attract the number of candidates that you really want to attract. I mean, so is it a wish list or is it a must have? I mean, rather than writing something like must have extensive experience with Amazon Workspaces, Cisco Meraki, and Microsoft Azure AD, try something like should have the ability to take the lead and take ownership with cloud infrastructure, networking, and Windows Server projects, drawing from past experience. So this leaves the door open for someone who kind of has done exactly what the job will be, but maybe not with exactly the tools and and sort of uh, technologies that they're going to be using for it. Because, I mean, honestly, there's a lot of people who can learn the specific platforms really quickly, and you don't want to alienate those people. And similarly, like MSP experience, like a lot of MSPs have tried all sorts of stuff. They've tried outsourcing to different countries. They've tried, um, you know, hiring college students who look really smart. They've tried this and that and the other thing. They've, uh, you know, tried hiring the corporate IT guy and then finding that the MSP environment for this person is just new, shocking, and too much to keep up with compared to their previous corporate job where they're pretty much using the same technologies all the time, one brand of desktop, one brand of server, one brand of router, and then they're thrown into this MSP wilderness um, of like all these different types of stuff, you know, and the whole customer service model as well. Um, but for the right person, I mean, who has the right approach, they'll be able to learn the business model and they'll find it exciting to be in a place where it's a little more fast pace where they get more exposure to learn new things and learning new things is what really excites technicians. It's not doing the same thing with the stuff they've been doing the same thing with for years. It's learning new things. And you want people who enjoy learning new things and have the ability to do it really quickly. And that's how you will get the magic for, you know, bringing people on and having them um, sort of like have great careers with you. And another job posting sort of mistake that I see a lot is not selling the company and its values and environment. You know, like a lot of these um, open position forms, as we call it, or job postings, they, they just look like it's all about the company and we're looking for someone who's going to do something for the company. But, they, but what you don't realize if you're writing this and putting this sort of thing out, it looks way too uh, one-sided. And, you know, be, these people have lots of an MSP experienced level two or level three resource can pretty much knock on the door of any MSP and say, hey, I'm MSP experienced. Um, 
Yep, I've used ConnectWise or Autotask. Yep, I know a lot about RMMs and all this sort of stuff. Yep, I've used IT Glue. I'm ready to go. And they'll be like, tell us more. When can you start? So in the first exposure they have to your company and its culture, sell your company because otherwise the best people will probably go with a company that knows how to better um, make itself look like an attractive place to apply to work with, to work in. And yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's not all about you and your company and it's not all about the applicant and what experience they've been. It's about the kind of relationship and environment you can create um, and the way that you can help your company grow with somebody who also is placed in your company and is growing. So emphasize these sorts of things that you are a place where people can grow their careers and you're interested in hiring someone long-term and treating them very well. Put that in the job posting because then it will stick out because a lot of companies just don't know this stuff. Selecting candidates. All right. So once you put out the job ad and you have um, 100, 200 applications in your inbox, we've all been there. And uh, a lot of those people just stay in there because you just see, uh, you know, it all looks the same after a while, you know, dear sir or madam, um, to whom it may concern. Um, yeah. And you just look at these endless piles of CVs or even worse, you have someone in the HR recruitment department who doesn't actually understand what the technologies mean and what the experience actually connotes. They look at that and they just select people who look good based on their experience and qualifications. Whereas, you know, anybody can put a bunch of industry buzzwords on their resume. You know, the Amazon AWS words, those words on a, on a resume does not actually tell you anything about what's going to happen when they actually get their hands on the technologies. Um, maybe they've got like uh, 10 minutes experience or maybe they've got 10 years experience. You don't really know. So yeah, the ideal candidate probably is somebody, yeah. I mean, they probably have a good CV, but you're probably looking for a lot of people um, you're lo looking at a lot of people who say the right things on there, but aren't the right people. And you're wasting your time interviewing them, basically. Um, so the main issue here, rather than just going what's written on the CV, before people actually get to get an interview, make a way of testing knowledge as part of the application process. What I'm talking about is a way for people to filter themselves out and show them show, show themselves as um, inappropriate for the position. How we've done this in Support Adventure is on the application, we have some multiple choice questions, which very quickly will show you if the person's engaged in the process of uh, doing the interview and engaged actually in the industry to uh, in a, such a way that's going to be useful for your MSP. So here's a question. Which of the following is an operating system? Office 365, Ubuntu, or Mac Pro? The answer is Ubuntu. It's a Linux distribution. Office 365 is a productivity productivity suite and Mac Pro is a piece of hardware, a computer. Ubuntu is an operating system. People should know this. And if they don't know it, they should be able to Google it. But people who are not paying attention or are faking their way through a, a job application probably would just be like, Mac Pro is an operating system. Yeah. Um, here's the next question. What, were the, what was the first major release of an operating system in the family of technologies that Windows 10 belongs to? MS-DOS, Windows 7, Windows NT 3.1 or C++. Now, either they're going to Google this or they're going to know this. Um, I know it because I've been following the Windows NT family of technologies um, since it was released in the late 90s. And this, that's what I built my chops on. Like um, I was in high school. This high school got 400 machines delivered. And guess what? I was actually the system admin because I knew more than the computer teachers at the age of 16. So you want these types of people. And this will very quickly find those types of, allow those types of people to pass the test or the people who can Google and find information that Windows 10 is in fact a part of the Windows NT family of operating systems and they'll pass too. But all the people who think that uh, MS-DOS was the first or Windows 7 was the first because, okay, Windows 10, 8, 7, the one before that was, okay. Yeah, it's Windows, no, wrong. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I didn't want to say Windows Vista because it, I just have bad feelings when, when I think about Windows Vista. It, it's a wound. And anyways, um, so 
another question. Which of the following is not a networking related command on Windows 10? Um, ping, GP update, IP config, or trace route? Again, someone who knows the industry has been in for a while would know that GP update is, is the one that's not. Um, it's, it's basically a group policy update. So it's coming from the domain and it's not related to the network layer of the operating system, but the rest are. Anyways, moving on. Um, you really want to filter those people out. Um, another mistake I, I see people making when they're processing applicants is psychological tests. Um, they have the, the people that they find um, interesting take a psychological test before ever speaking to someone. And we've seen that this has alienated a lot of technicians who would rather work in a place who is willing to have a conversation before they want to see like a psychological test because some people rightly or wrongly view a psychological test as a either sort of like a sneaky or sort of inaccurate or inhuman way of viewing their intelligence and suitability for a job and you'll alienate those people. So I'm all for if you want to give it to them after the interview would work great and find out if they have like some serious like personality defects that will keep them from being a member of your team. But don't do it before you talk to them and win them over. And um, here's another one. When processing applicants at Support Adventure, we always invite people to introduce themselves on video. To be introduced, to invited to an interview to, or a seminar that we do for candidates, they have to submit an intro video. This filters out a lot of the people who would just rather stay unseen in their basement. And you get the people who are willing to show you who they are, and how they speak, and how they present themselves on video. And a lot of those videos will be really horrible. And by filtering them out at this stage, you'll save, you'll save their time and your time and you'll be able to get into interviews only with people that you already like. How about that? Wouldn't that be nice? Isn't it awkward when it's not like that, when you don't like the person and you know that after 10 seconds? So let's move on to interviews. We see lots of mistakes in the ways that MSPs uh, interview people, technicians, especially senior technicians with great experience. And they just turn it into like, again, a one-sided thing. Like they don't build rapport. They don't connect on a personal level. Um, it's too sort of businessy, professional, cold. They almost have an interrogation style job interview. It's too technical in nature, trying to like kind of just figure out, like, as I said, specific technologies, do they know that stuff? Well, maybe they can learn it. What does you asking a super specific technology about, um, a sp super specific question about a technology show you about what they can become when they're exposed to that technology and what they can know after a few weeks or months of working with that technology. So yeah, that's a huge mistake that we see so much. Um, a lot of interviews, again, one-sided, not describing the environment they're providing, not pr describing the specific KPIs and experience uh, and the experience of like what, what the person is trying to measure up to. At, at the company, what, where's the goalpost, folks? Like, how are you going to judge them? And how can they know they're doing a good job? Not describing the training and onboarding procedure. What can, uh, if they sign up to work with your MSP, what can they expect in terms of training? Is it just like, here are your logins, good luck? Or is it like, well, you're going to watch a bunch of uh, super well-crafted videos that show you exactly how to use the technologies. Then you're going to be given tasks so you can actually get your hands dirty on it. And then you're going to work support tickets while being shadowed by one of our best, most charismatic and knowledgeable, quick thinking technicians. And then um, you're going to shadow that person and then they're going to shadow you and then you'll be ready to go. If you don't tell them that, how are they going to know that it's going to be a great onboarding? It's going to be easy to get started because you've done it before. There is a plan. You're not just winging it with training and just sort of like um, setting them there and forgetting that they're there and then getting some complaints from clients and just like, oh, how come they don't know this? Well, because you didn't train them. So tell them about that. Tell them about the growth opportunities to grow with your company, grow their careers in your company, to hit, hit the next level, technically become a level two from level one, to become a level three from level two, to become a level 9,000 super tech someday, if that's what they want to do, to become a manager if they, they want to manage other, other people and stuff like that. Yeah. And you're not expressing your values either a lot of the time in these interviews. The interviewers just don't talk about the company and their values. You know, that's a great way to start the interview. 
And you really need to make your company seem like a great place to work because there are a lot of MSPs that are great places to work. Guess what? There's a lot of MSPs that are horrible places to work. We've seen it all. And um, usually you can tell by the interview, the communication, the subcommunication, the vibe of the person interviewing and um, the best technicians will uh, go running from you if you uh, make some of these mistakes I just outlined. So let's talk more about training. I touched on it in the last one. And one thing about training that I really like to see, um, and we do it in all our deals at Support Adventure, is a trial period. A trial period means that they don't have the job until they pass one month, sort of probation or two months or three months, whatever you want to do. Set the goalposts and let them know they need to, it's not just you got the job, I saw your resume, you're great, you got the job. It's like, we saw your resume, we gave you a test task, we interviewed you. You seem like the person for the job, but we'll know after two to four weeks and then get them on the job and give them the attention that they need to get across the goal line. And a lot of companies don't have a structured way to do this. They don't have any idea on what it's just like, oh, yeah, just shadow Bob. It's like, well, Bob's been working with your company for a long time and he's developed a lot of really ingrained bad habits which are going to be passed on to the new person and you have no documentation on how you do things on ConnectWise or the RMM or anything like that. Yeah. You don't have a well-indexed body of standard operating proce procedures, documentation specs, um, all that sort of jazz that makes it easy for people to know how to do their job. It's just like a free-for-all. Everybody just does what they want and yeah, just shadow Bob. Yeah, he'll show you what to do. Okay. That works until about five technicians, folks. But after five technicians, it probably isn't going to be the best way forward. Not having recorded materials. What you can do is if you do make a really good training that's structured and stuff like that, you give it to someone. And then you record the call of that onboarding or, you know, with the screen sharing and stuff like that. And then when you have the next person to train, you make them watch it. You saved a lot of effort there. And uh, you, you can make them watch it and take notes about any questions they may have and what content they learned. And then you can supplement that, answer the questions, and, and fill in any gaps that have occurred in their knowledge afterwards. Um, you'll save a lot of time with this. And the last one is really where I think, well, actually, there's a few more. OK. So not having go get a tasks. What I mean by go get a task is like if you want to teach a, a dog how to chase a ball, you don't hold a ball in front of them and talk about the ball for like 20 minutes. The best is you hold the ball in front of them really quickly and just show them, hey, I got a ball. And then you throw it and let them go get it. What this means in an MSP environment is like, okay, we give you the logins. We told you what ConnectWise is and stuff like this. Now to test that, why don't you go and log into this client server, you know, the, you know, the primary domain controller from client uh, B, Bailey Law Firm or something, log into their server and take a screenshot of the uptime and log that in the ticket. What do they have to do? They have to go on IT glue. They need to find that server. They need to go to the RMM, find that server, use the password from IT glue, know how to use the RMM remote control. They need to know how to use ConnectWise, the proper statuses, and log the ticket, take a screenshot, all that sort of stuff. And they're learning by doing, as a lot of us really do. And a lot of us do learn by doing. And you guys assume that we should know a lot of stuff that we might not from our experience, because the, it's very inconsistent who has what experience in the industry. And you can never assume this. I mean, as the old saying goes, if you assume you make an ass of you and me and this, we've seen a lot of bad situations where people just uh, assumed a tech should know something, then they do something that the management or senior, senior techs wouldn't have wanted them to do. And well, it's because they didn't have any procedures for doing otherwise, and they were just winging it. The biggest problem in the MSP space is everyone's just winging it. Yep, super smart people can solve all sorts of problems, put out all sorts of fires, but at one point it just becomes too much, too much winging it and you need structure. So another training thing, not checking ticket notes. You should check their ticket notes. At the end of each week, when they're in training, check their ticket notes, see how it looks, see how much time they've utilized, see if they're putting in details on how they solve the issues, how they're doing their escalations and all that sort of stuff. Does it tell a story of them getting to know things and solving issues efficiently or not? 
If it doesn't, you need to coach them on that. You need to have standards for how ticket notes should be uh, applied in the organization. And not following up the last thing in a structured way after they're across the go line. So they're doing the work. You've seen that they're competent. They're settling in. After that, follow up. Keep on checking the ticket notes. Ask them what they've learned. Ask them what they still don't know. Look at their escalations. Make sure that their escalations come back down to them if the senior tech uh, can be uh, persuaded to leave good ticket notes on how they solve the problem that the junior tech, for example, could not solve. Make sure that they're mentored by that information and make sure that they're feeling good with the amount of work, um, the relationships they have with people like the service coordinator or dispatch, service test manager, um, the other techs, senior techs, um, various different clients and stuff. Make sure they feel good. Follow up. And then I think if you follow all of these tips that I've just said and you actually get the right people with the right sort of vibe, because vibe counts for a lot when picking people. So that's why your job interview should have a good vibe that makes them feel re respected and not rejected or interrogated or something like that. But if you follow all of this, I think you've got a pretty good chance of getting some really good, talented people on your MSP. And wouldn't that feel good? Think about that. Um, because a lot of these MSPs, <laughs> they don't know how to do it. So you can... Uh, you, you can probably find that tech out there who's going to be amazing, super competent, super quick thinking, even though he doesn't have experience like, um, you know, doing the very specific thing that you need. So keep it in mind. Thanks a lot. This is MSP Mountain. If you like this video, subscribe and uh, we'll catch you later.